This handout shows how to use Nika package within Igor Pro. Um, it follows a 2D data reduction handout which is, should be available on the web and uh, this handout has part 1 and part 2 and it also uses data which should be available with this handout for download so if you want to actually follow in reading what is being shown in this movie or use the data which are shown in this movie please visit the uh, Nika web page from which you should be able to download these, these data so <clears throat> in this uh, I will show how a um, results of small angle scattering experiment can be reduced uh, using Nika package how the data can be calibrated, must be created and um, how a uh, 1D line out of the data can be obtained. In this case we need to have some parameters which I will explain during the during the movie. So first let's start with loading in the uh, Nika package inside Igor Pro. So if Nika is installed in the command macros should be available command load Nika to the slash macros and when you select that after a few seconds you will find that uh, you have a new menu item here which is sas 2 d This installs Nika. Install Nika is now available to you. From here you can select a main panel for control of Nika. You can then select various types of tools which you need to use for Nika. A few more commands. The main command which I'd like to draw your attention to is this open Nika PDF manual which would open a PDF manual for you. So let's open uh, first the main panel and let's go through the main panel. This is Nika's main panel. Um, the top part here is where the data can be selected. Uh, the data path will be later listed here and the data available will be here. These are image data, so these are 2D images. A number of different image types is available. Um, there are a few other buttons which description is described well in the manual. Um, and then there are tabs with various parameters, um, various choices and various analysis methods. There are buttons which control um, control various uh, processes in Nika. So let's first uh, find uh, some of the data. So we push the button select data path. In this case we get a dialog from the Mac system and um, you can look on um, you can uh, look for the data. The data should be available inside a folder examples of samples which are measured the data. These are tip images. So if we choose that we populate the images out here and you can see we have sample 1 measured for 40 seconds, 60 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 seconds for sample 2, 3 and 4. These are just included few images so one has something to play with. If you have a large number of images and you want to just display some of them you can use uh, this field here, for example, we want to measure on, uh, see only the 40 second one, we can just put in star, 40 seconds star, and we will see that this is a string match system. So now we have the images data path displayed here. Next, we need to fill in the um, first tab, the main tab, with some of the parameters. So first, these are parameters which need to be known for the experiment. So in this specific case the detector distance was approximately 570 millimeters. The wavelength we used was 12 kilo electron volts so we can select 12 here and a uh, wavelength is calculated automatically. Pixel size was actually this is a MarCCD detector which is 2K by 2K detector and the pixel size is approximately 79 um, micron but since we had it binned down to 1K by 1K, 2 by 2 binning, so the pixel size is 0.158 millimeters and 0.158 millimeters. Um, we will see for the beam center later. So this is the main parameters for an experiment we need to have available. Now we need to evaluate and uh, now we need to calibrate the beam center 
and get proper sample to detect the distance. There's a special tool for that. We go in SAS 2D, pick up beam center and geometry corrections, and here we have a tool. In here we will select data path, but instead of examples of data, we need to select data path to AG Behemate distance calibration. And we choose that, and we have a image here. With this, we can now make an image. I'll shrink the image so it's inside the movie itself. And in here, what you see is this red dot is the beam center. You can actually make the circle slightly larger. So we can actually see that it's not in center. But we can move it with arrows. These are just a step which we will take. And now we can see if we can it goes in the wrong direction, so we can walk it closer, and we can walk it here. Oh, no. oh, now we can make the step maybe smaller, and we can probably find approximately the right position. So with this, we have estimated where the beam center is going to be. Next, what we can do is we can go in Calibrant. We know we used Silver Behenade, AG Behenade, that's predefined here. You can see that it predefined the D-spacings for us. And <clears throat> what you can see here, and you can actually zoom in the image, so you can actually see it easier. What you can see is you can see all that's a white line. That's the, calib that's the distance to the ring for this specific d-spacing d calculated from the parameters which we put in the main panel. And you can see the two red lines here, which, uh, def uh, which define the width plus minus 15, 15 pixels. That's a, a range in which Nika will actually try to find the maximum by fitting a Gaussian to it. So then we can go, and this is pretty good because if you say, if you uncheck the display, you're going to see that there are two lines which we are very well covering with our estimates, so we're pretty close. Next we go to refinement, and what we do is we will refine the beam center, and we will refine the sample to detect the distance. We will not refine wavelength because that is somehow coupled, at least in small angle scattering region, with the sample to detect the distance. And in small angle scattering, usually we don't care about the tilts because they're usually negligible. This will, uh, the way this will work is it will run 60, 60 different line outs along the circles, fit a Gaussian to them, find the positions, and then run a least square refinement for that. So now we can hit the button refinement. You can see how the um, line outs are plotted out here. And you can see that we have optimized the parameters. It's somehow easier to see if you click display in image. That slows it down and you'll be able to observe as we do the line outs along this distance and then we'll do a line outs around that. So then we take 60 and 60 sets and after that we run a least square fitting. The parameters are automatically pushed in the in the main panel. So in the main panel you can see that we have 566.098 millimeters the distance, about 4 millimeters away from what we expected, and we have proper beam center values. So now we have calibrated the distance and we have calibrated the beam center. Next what we need to do is we now have to design a mask because our data needs to have be masked. There is a beam stop which we need to remove and there are some edges. For that we can go in and uh, say create mask. Again we get the uh, we get the panel. Select data to path. Now for creating mask very good is using glassy carbon. Glassy carbon samples scatter very homogeneously and you can easily see any artifacts. So now we have a two measurements of glassy carbon. This is actually a mask I created in a previous attempt, so we can uh, select any one of them. Say make image. Oh, sorry, select the TIFF file here, and then say make image. Now what we see is we can see an image which is very homogeneously covered by a glassy carbon. Um, you can actually display a log intensity. 
and you can see that we have areas which are dark blue. Those areas are actually inactive of the CCD, so there are zeros. And then we have areas which are colored, which is now it's a log intensity. And so it's easier to see any artifacts, any problems. You can actually see the uh, this is a this is a holder for the beam stop, and you can actually see a shadow of something out here. So the first thing we need to do is say start mask draw, which creates a puts puts the tools in in draw in drawing mode. And the next thing what we may want to do is mask low intensity points. If you do that, automatically anything set to uh, lower intensity than this value here is set to, to uh, is masked off. So you can set here maybe 0 0.5 or so as a threshold value. That means all of the white stuff is, has been already removed. The next thing what we need to do is remove the uh, holder for the beam stop and beam stop itself. To do that, we will click here and you can zoom in the area so it's easier to draw. Don't worry about the skewness of this thing, it's just a question of zooming properly. And now we need to use some of these tools, either square or circle or something, to cover the areas we don't like. The easiest way is to use this tool here to draw anything which seems to be reasonably rectangular. And basically, in this case, we want to come in here and draw something which looks large enough so it covers that. And next, what we want to do is create a circle which would cover the beam stop. And you may have to get a little bit used to ego drawing tools, but it's relatively easy after a few attempts. So now we have created something which covers reliably anything which should not be counted. When we are done with that, you can actually push Control A or Command A in this case, and you're going to see it as you covered everything. If you had any other elements which you wanted to mask off, you would cover them now with some other tools. When we are done, we say Finish Mask and give the mask a new name. This mask 2 will work just fine and hit save. You can see it actually appeared here and that's a name of a special, a speci specifically defined TIFF file which contains zeros and ones for Nika to know which, which points used and which points not to use. Now the same mask has been already stored in Nika and saved for you, so you don't have to reload it for this specific case. So now we have the mask. Next thing what we want to do is actually do absolute intensity calibration. We have measured glassy carbon, uh, secondary absolute intensity standard, which also there is available ASCII data which are measured on absolutely calibrated USAX instrument. And so one can actually use these measurements to provide an absolute intensity calibration. To do that, we will first find the data to uh, glassy carbon measurements in the main panel. And we have to remove this, and then we can see them. So now these are the glassy carbon measurements we had measured. Notice they are measured for five seconds. That's the under bar 5s in there, so we're going to have to deal with that too. Now, <clears throat> the best way to analyze this, we want to use sample thickness, it's one millimeter, but we want to use that. We do have sample transmission, which we have to account for. We will eventually account for sample correction factor, so let's put it in there at this moment. In this specific case, we will not use I0 monitor because it would be a bit more challenging to pull it out of the ASCII files, but in the real world, we actually do use that. But we have measured dark field and empty field. With these parameters, now, this is the formula which is being used to calibrate your data. You can actually work out the formula if it agrees with what you like to do. Next, what we want to do is put in the right parameters. So the parameters are available here. Uh, we can use geometry correction with a relatively short distance, even though in small angle scattering this is usually negligible. Polarization correction is not necessary in this case. Sample thickness is one millimeter. Sample transmission measured for uh, this sample was 0 
correction factor for now will be one. We will actually change that to get calibrated data into the future. We will use mask and we have already the mask we just created in there so we can use that. And we will use empty and dark so we have to find them. They are available to you in the folder provided as empty and dark fields. And what we will do is we will select the five second dark, hit low dark field. As you can see, there's nothing to be seen, so we can close that. We select MP5 and load it in. Uh, this one, of course, looks much more interesting. That's an empty field. We can also close that. It's available. You have them listed out here. Currently loaded empty file is the five second one, and dark file is five second one. At this moment, we will assume that the that the uh, data can be calibrated by using simply the same time. We will then, of course, have to understand that the calibration constant, the C, is time dependent and will have to correct for different times. Um, it would be much more appropriate to use monitor and use an I0, which then takes out any problems with time. But uh, about that, more you can read in the manual. The next thing is we'll just hit the tab sectors and we'll just simply do a sector average, circular sector average. We can easily do only 250 points, more is not necessary. I create one D graph and store it in here, and for simplicity, we'll just use input data for output. More details on this are in the menu. Next, we have all the parameters, and we can therefore now hit button convert selected files one at a time. And after a few seconds, depending on your CPU and image size, the Igor will produce two things. You will find that you have a 2D image which has been absolutely calibrated, available in Igor, and then you have a lineout which is now an intensity as a function of a Q vector. This one has a name which is associated with the uh, name of the file we used. So we used GC Bob 5 seconds 200 and the wave name we have displayed is R on the bar GC Bob 5 seconds 200 on the bar C means a circular average. Next we need to compare this with the available ASCII data which are provided to you and for that purpose the best way to do it is, is actually use IRENA package, a small part of it. So we can go to macros and load Irina says macros, which I strongly encourage you actually install. And we have another menu here. The first thing we need to do is import in the Irina package the ASCII file provided to you. And that's actually the ASCII classic pop calibrated data. We can click on the data set now available to us. We can test it. When you test it, Igor will find out how many columns there are. And I'll tell you that the first column is Q vector, second intensity, third is error. It's in Q is in 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 inverse angstrom, so that's okay. And we can use these two checkboxes to import the data in a way which is reasonable. With that, now we have the data inside Igor properly named and stored, so uh, the other Igor tools can use them. The best way to address this is actually use data manipulation number one, which allows us to compare two data sets. We will select a QRS at the top, and now we have the imported data available, as well as the Nika reduced data. We'll put the import data at the top, we select the same thing for the bottom and put a bob underneath that, the current one, and graph the data. As you can see in the graph, the data do not agree on vertical scale, but other than that they look very similar, except there is some there are some artifacts of very low Q values, which are routinely a problem with not properly masked the beam stop, so you may have different artifacts here. And then of course there's a background at the at the high <coughs> high Q. With this tool, you can very easily scale the data together, select data in the area where there are no artifacts on one or the other curve, 
and don't go too high in Q because the different amount of flat background would confuse everything. But if you select a reasonable range of data, you can then hit button Auto Scale, and the data are perfectly scaled together. As you can see, they perfectly match except for the first few data points here, which I said are contaminated by the beam stop scattering. Other than that, we got perfect agreement, and there is a value which we got 0.30845 or so. That's the calibration constant we can now use to actually co uh, calibrate our data at 5 seconds. If we have an exposure for a longer time, we have to scale this number by multiplying by 5 seconds and dividing by the exposure time. So let's copy that and let's put it in the parameters in the C volume. Oops, yes, it's the correct volume. Now we can close this, close that. And now we can process this classic carbon bob again. Yes, we're going to override, and we got now the data from classic carbon bob. We can now compare those by plotting those together. So we can compare the calibrated data from USEX instrument. And now we can do the same thing with the bob after the calibration. You can see there's a perfect agreement. The disagreement at high Q is just different amount of flat background in each one of them. The difference here is just the beam stop skipping. So with this we have now absolute calibration for the uh, five seconds time. So we can close this, close that, close this window, close this window. So now we can actually get to doing some data reduction of the data themselves. So with that, we can find the data again. So let's go in select data path and find the sample data. You can see CD images, examples of data, choose that. Again, let's do only 40 seconds. And let's calculate one thing. Here we can do print. This is our calibration constant. Multiply by 5 divided by 40. This is a calibration constant for 40 seconds. So we can use that and put it as a correction factor in here. So now we have correction factor for the 40 seconds time. Um, the other thing we have to do is we have to always for each sample change the transmission. So let's put the transmission in there which is available in the handout for sample 1 which is 943, 0 0.943. Sample thickness in this case will 300 microns. These are the numbers which you need to know. This is a number which is specific for a, for a given, uh, given setup and the type of calibration you use here. If we would change and uh, use the monitor the number, the calibration number would change and at the same time it would not be any more time dependent because it would be dependent on the I0 counts. So it's very important you will reduce the glassy carbon the same way as you are now going to reduce the samples. The next thing what we need to do is we can use the same mask, parameters are set correctly, we need to, we can use the same mask but what we need to do is change the empty and dark so we want to do dark 40 seconds and we use empty 40 seconds because we want to have these for the same time. So now we have an empty 40 seconds and dark 40 seconds available too. The next thing what we want to do is decide how are we going to analyze the data. The easiest way is, and these data are isotropic, is by using the first tab here, the sectors, but using the circular average. Among ref points 250, you can make a higher, you can make a higher or a smaller number, doesn't matter. But at this moment, if you take sample one and hit convert, you will get appropriate intensity versus Q for this sample. And you can do various things with this. You can actually display a log intensity. We see we actually have some weird diffraction spots here. Um, you can display beam center, which will show you uh, the beam center here. 
you can actually display the image with the Q axes. So now you have a QX, QY displayed here. And you can display this way. You can actually display with Q axis with grids, and then you can read the out of the grid positions. You can read where, for example, diffraction, diffraction uh, spots are, and so on. Anyway, so this way you can produce a line out of the intensity versus Q, and this is a circular average. That's what the underbar C means. You can also do sectors, for example. So uncheck that. Do this. Let's do only six sectors at start is 0 and let's do angle is um, 15 in order to see them we just hit the display and angle is probably more let's do 30 and what you have here is if you do this you have one sector which goes around 0 that's the black line and the yellow lines which are difficult to see on log scale so let's unlock that the yellow lines are the edges that's the width of the sector so it's 10 degrees one way 10 degrees other way so this would be a sector which has a central direction 0 plus minus 10 degrees that's 30 plus minus 10 degrees and so on so with that you can now do a convert file again and after a long term of calculations you will find out that this sample is really isotropic because all of those sectors do have the same same curve. What you can see is you can see that the naming is always the name of the sample. Under bar 0 is the centraloid angle. Under bar 10 is the width. So you have a description of in which direction and how wide the sector was directly in the, in the file name. Um, you can see that there's very little differences in between the samples. There are some statistical differences, but that's not much. So this is one of the basic methods how the Igor, uh, Enika in Igor can reduce your data. Now, there are other methods to use, um, which are interesting to see. This uh, tab preview allows you to generate an intensity in a form of line outs in a large number of sectors and the width here so let's do only 180 sectors which makes it the width two degrees and let's start at zero and go at 360 so basically at this moment we will generate something which will plot the intensity as a function of an angle uh, we can just hit create sector graph and here is the graph so now what you have is you have this, uh, this is the pixel axis, that's the distance from the center in pixels. This is the azimuthal angle. So this is one line out next to each other. And this is a very useful way how to looking on the, uh, on the images in case that you uh, have, for example, diffraction peaks and want to see if, they, if everything is aligned properly or not. Uh, let's do one more thing. Let's just check the mask, the data here, and recreate the image so it's easier to see. Okay, here is the image after using also the mask, the same image. You can also display on lock intensity, which makes it again easier to see sometimes, sometimes not. You can change the intensity scaling by the sliders. You can also then come in here. In sas 2D is a tool image line profile. If you use that tool, it will now create. There's a there's a window where you can control it from. So let me just put it out here. So you can control it from here. You can see that this is going to do image line profile in horizontal direction. You get some other controls here. So for example, um, we can make the width. Uh, narrower, just about two pixels, and you can see that the blue curves got closer together. Those are the lines. You can uh, that's the edges in between we are integrating. The position is here. This tool actually can drag this around, and you can see it's being updated automatically here. So you can get a line out as a in the intensity as a function of either pixels.
or Q or D or two data, you can also save the line out. Now, if this is displayed in log intensity, then this is a log intensity, so it's displayed as a function of Q, and you can see that it changed into Q, and you can actually put that on a log scale, and you can see that very much we resemble what we have resembled before, which is correct. You can also turn this into vertical line out, which is very useful, and use pixels. It's very useful because now you can drag it along and see what is the variation as a function of a azimutal angle. So this is like if you were doing a intensity variation around a circle on your detector. And you can see there is some variation in log intensity. If we uncheck that uh, and then update it a bit. You can see there is some variation in here between 20 and 23 pixels. And there's some spike here, so we hit it on some hot spot somewhere. Anyway, so that's a second tool which you can use. Close the window first. Now there's a third tool which you can use. There's a line profile tool which is uh, usable on the third tab. You hit use. And <coughs> you can now here uh, do profile along various types of lines. It would be a vertical line, horizontal line. You can put a line in arbitrary angle and this tool can be used for analysis of grazing incident geometry uh, data. So if you use GI, vertical line or horizontal line, those are the options which you have to collect data along in GI. So if you do that, you actually get controls for you get controls for incident angle and then the Q calculations do correct for that. But let's play with something less excessive at this moment, angle line. And in this moment, what you see is you get another line profile view here, and you can control that. This is azimutal angle, so let's go 45 degrees, and you can see how it displays now the line at the top in the top picture. You can then change the width, make the width wider. This is width in pixels. Uh, you can also, if you need it, offset it in pixels. So let's go 25 pixels off. That's the shortest distance from the center to the line. And again, you can see that if you make it big enough, you can see it has a center line, which is black. It has a two yellow lines between which it, uh, it integrates. So if I make the width only about maybe three pixels, which is reasonable, and zero, it's a intensity along a 45 degrees from the beam center. And here you have a various choices. You can use Q, QY, QZ. You can use a logarithmic axis, logarithmic in Y. Uh, you can save the data if you need to. More details are in the manual. And you can actually use this to process the data as you load them in. So this can be used uh, together with the sector tools, for example, or each one of them separately. The preview tool can be used only manually through this create sector graph. Line profile and sectors tools are called every time you select one of these convert buttons. You get one, two, and three convert buttons for the description. Please read the manual. And you can then create graphs and you can store it in experiment. Um, this is basically all there is about Nika in this handout and in this movie. If you need more details, please note that you can go here and say open Nika PDF manual. It is available to you on your computer and it can be it will be opened by a browser and PDF, PDF reader which you have installed on your computer. Um, that's all. Thank you very much.